Mike was having a beer in the living room one evening while watching a football game. His five-year-old son, Rob, was playing with Legos on the floor. Hey, Dad, but I can make one of these Legos disappear, Rob told his dad. Mike was only half paying attention to his son since his favorite team was playing. Uh Uh-huh, Mike absentmindedly answered. Ta-da, I made it disappear, Rob said proudly. Mike asked his son what his secret was. A magician never tells, Rob said while tapping his nose. Mike shrugged his shoulders. Guess, Daddy, guess, Rob encouraged. Mike first guessed the Lego was in his son's pocket. He was wrong. Then Mike guessed that the Lego was in his son's sock. That, too, was a wrong guess. Mike gave up. It's in my nose, Dad, Rob proudly declared. Mike spit out his beer and rushed to look up his son's nose. He couldn't see anything up there. He went to the kitchen junk drawer and took out a small flashlight. Mike looked up his son's nose again. He still couldn't see the bright yellow Lego piece. Are you sure it's up there? Mike asked his son. Rob nodded. Does it hurt? Mike asked. Rob shook his head. Mike didn't want to stick anything up his son's nose to try and take out the mini toy brick. He was scared. He would push the Lego up higher and hurt his son. I guess we have to go to the hospital, Mike told his son. Rob looked scared. It was a short drive to the hospital emergency room. Mike felt like the most negligent dad in the world when he told the triage nurse the reason for the visit. My son has a Lego stuck up his left nostril, Mike said in a low voice. Hannah was worried about the plants in her garden. Her state recently declared a drought and her plants were showing that they missed the rain. Her plants were all dead or dying. Their leaves were brown and dry. Even the small patch of grass in front of her house was drying up because of the lack of rain and the overall shortage of water. Hannah didn't want to give up on her garden. She loved spending time in her yard. She loved working with her hands in the dirt. She loved watering the plants and watching week by week her hard work pay off. From a small seed in the soil, she grew flowers and herbs. This season, though, was a bust. She began to do some research on the internet on drought-resistant plants, which are plants that would do all right in full sun and without regular water. It turned out there were quite a few plants that were drought resistant. Through her internet search, Hannah even found a website for a place that was selling native plants, which were grown naturally from her climate. Hannah laughed at the name though. It was called a nursery. Hannah always thought a nursery was a bedroom for a newborn baby or a very young child, not a place to buy plants. The more she thought about it, though, the more it made sense. Going to a nursery was like going to get a baby, except in this case, the baby was a plant she would bring home. Hannah drove 30 minutes to get to the nursery, which had a whole section of drought-resistant plants. She walked up and down the outdoor aisles, carefully considering her options. Then she stopped in front of a small seedling 
that was just flowering. I found my baby, she thought. Catherine loved Facebook. With Facebook, she could keep in contact with her family, no matter how far away they were. She could see photographs of her cousins and read status updates from her aunts and uncles. With Facebook, she could keep her relatives up to date on what she was doing. With a few taps on the keyboard and hitting the send button, she could tell a dozen or more people about her new job. She could also send pictures so that they wouldn't worry that she wasn't eating enough or was unhealthy. Another thing Catherine loved about Facebook was that she didn't have to think about time zones when updating family. Whenever she called her parents or other relatives, she always had to think about the time difference so that she wouldn't wake someone up or call when she knew they were at church. Facebook was so convenient. Another thing happened when Catherine joined Facebook, though. Some people she went to high school with started to add her as a friend. At first, this didn't bother her. She loved learning about the success of people she knew when she was just a teenager. She loved finding out people were getting married, having babies, and traveling. Soon, however, Catherine found herself comparing herself to the people she was reading about on Facebook. It began to make her feel bad that some people seemed to be doing so much better than she was. They had better jobs, nicer clothes, and cuter boyfriends. She was also spending a lot of time on Facebook. It took a lot of time and energy to keep up with everyone's status updates. Catherine started to think. She looked at the list of over 500 friends she had on Facebook and realized some of them were not really friends at all. Jose Luis was taking the train to work one day when he noticed a woman with a big German shepherd getting on the train. This made him nervous. What if that dog attacked someone? Jose Luis didn't know that people could bring pets with them onto trains. It seemed unsafe. He stepped closer to the dog. The German shepherd seemed friendly enough. Just as he put out his hand to pet the dog, the woman stopped him. Please don't pet him. He's working, the lady told him. Jose Luis didn't understand. The woman explained that she was blind and that the dog Hampton acted as her eyes, helping her navigate her way around the city. The woman pointed out the special vest that Hampton was wearing. The vest was printed with the words, Service Animal. Jose Luis had never heard of service animals before. Service animals like Hampton are allowed into public places that most pets are not. Hampton is more than a pet. He helps me to be self-sufficient and do the things that I need to do in the city, the woman explained. The woman also told Jose Luis that service animals had to go through special training so that they learn how to behave in public places and do not get distracted. People need to help, though, by not petting him, the woman added. The woman continued to explain that service animals do not just help the blind. Some animals act as therapy animals. Therapy animals go into hospitals and nursing homes. These animals lower the stress levels of people who are very sick or who have just had operations. They also encourage people to recover. Therapy animals are especially popular 
in children's hospitals. Dogs really can be man's best friends. Michelle was tired after a long day at work. She just wanted to get home, order a pizza for dinner, and go to bed. As she sat on the train home, she closed her eyes. Suddenly, she heard music. It was a harmonica playing a sad song. It sounded like a blues song. She opened her eyes to look where the sound was coming from. Was it from someone's iPod with the volume up loud? The sound was coming from a man leaning against the subway doors, playing a harmonica. When he finished playing the song, he walked up and down the aisles with a cup in his hand, asking for tips. Michelle didn't feel like this was fair. While the music wasn't unpleasant, it's not like she had a choice. She was forced to listen to it since she has to take the train home from work. Now he was asking to be paid by the people being forced to listen. He had some nerve. Michelle didn't give the man any money. Some of her fellow commuters did drop a few coins in the man's cup. You shouldn't encourage that. Michelle told one of her fellow commuters after he dropped some change in the man's cup. I don't even think it's legal for him to play music in the train and ask for money, Michelle said. She then scanned the advertisements and notices inside the train car. Sure enough, she found a sign that said playing music and soliciting was not allowed, and that there would be a fine for people caught by the police. When the harmonica player passed by Michelle and extended his cup out so he could put in some change, she pointed to the sign. The harmonica player shrugged his shoulders. We all have to make a living, lady, he said. School was over for the year. This meant that the school's after-school program, which kept Adriana's daughter, June, in school until she was done with work, was also over. The after-school program was convenient because June didn't have to leave the school. Adriana didn't have to worry about her daughter, being home alone. The after-school program also made sure that June did her homework. This made Adriana's job as a single mother so much easier. All she had to worry about when she picked her daughter up from school was dinner. One of the best things about the after-school program was the cost. It only cost $30 a month. The school did not offer a summer program. Adriana did not have a summer vacation from work, so she needed to find a program that would watch June while she was working. Hiring a private babysitter was too expensive. Another mom from June's school gave Adriana information about a local recreational center that was offering a summer program for school-age kids. The program was not as expensive as other summer camp programs, but was more expensive than after-school cost, though. The summer program cost $50 a week. Adriana didn't know how she could afford the program. June didn't understand the sacrifices her mother had to make for her. She was just excited to attend the summer program. She had never been in summer camp before. June was especially excited because her friends would be there with her. Sometimes summer was boring 
especially since her mom worked all day. June heard there would be games and crafts. She was going to make something nice for her mom to thank her. Emma felt really bad when someone from her daughter Jessica's school informed her that Jessica needed special education services. Emma felt like she had failed as a mother. It was true that Jessica was always delayed when it came to learning to talk and walk. Emma just thought that her child was different. Every child develops at its own rate. Jessica was five years old now, but still was not speaking in complete sentences. Jessica would not be attending a regular kindergarten in a regular school. Instead, she would be attending kindergarten in a special education school. While this bothered Emma at first, she soon learned to appreciate the school. Jessica had a specialized learning plan called an Individualized Education Plan, or IEP. This plan set up specific goals for Jessica, like learning how to feed herself. Jessica also received a lot of individual attention. Instead of her being in a classroom with 20 students, there were only eight students in her class. All of these students also were delayed, like Jessica. In addition, the class had two teacher's assistants to help the classroom teacher. The special education school also scheduled speech therapy sessions for Jessica. Once a day, a specialist would come in and work with Jessica to help her practice learning how to move her mouth and tongue and ask for what she needed and wanted. An occupational therapist helped Jessica learn to feed herself and other age-appropriate self-sufficiency skills. A physical therapist also came in to help Jessica. Emma may have been embarrassed at first that her daughter was in a special education school, but after a year, Emma realized it was the best thing for her. While Jessica still was a little behind other kids of her age, at the end of kindergarten, she was able to attend a non-special education school. Chris knew many of the fathers made fun of him. He was pretty sure some of the mothers did too. He was the president of the Parent-Teacher Association at his daughter's school. He organized all the bake sales, book sales, and met with the school principal regularly to share concerns he heard from other parents. This is not why parents made fun of him. Other parents made fun of him because this was all he did. Chris was a stay-at-home dad. His wife, Maureen, had a demanding full-time job working for an investment bank. She made an excellent salary, but the job meant going in early and coming home late. Chris was never good at holding a regular job. He got bored easily. He'd rather focus on his daughter and what was going on at her school. He became the main caregiver. Chris handled all of the household duties. He took his daughter to and from school. He did all the grocery shopping and cooked all the meals. He cleaned the house and helped his daughter with her homework. Everyone in the neighborhood called Chris Mr. Mom. There were other names Chris heard people calling him, like house husband and house spouse. Chris didn't mind his role at all. He felt secure as a man. He didn't believe that a woman's place was in the home. He was glad that his wife loved her job 
and worked hard. He worked hard too. He just didn't get a salary like Maureen did. He was happy being paid the love and appreciation from his family. Sometimes Chris felt lonely though. When he took his daughter to the park, there were no other dads around. He felt strange talking to the mothers. He didn't want them to think he was hitting on them or trying to pick them up. December is truly a special time. People start putting up their Christmas decorations and lights outside their homes. Christmas is wonderful because family members from far away come to visit. We eat, drink, and talk about how our lives are going. One of my favorite things to do when my family comes over to visit is go for a ride in my dad's car and see all the houses with their Christmas lights on. Last year, my dad told us that he had seen a neighborhood with the whole block filled with houses with lights. We decided to go see them. The whole family crammed into two cars. We drove for about 40 minutes. When we got there, our faces lit up with joy at the sight of all the lights. My cousins decided that they wanted to walk outside and watch the lights. We all got out and started walking. But when it was time to go back home, we didn't notice that my youngest brother was not in the car. He had separated from the family and went to see a house all the way at the end. No one noticed, and we left him there for an hour. He knocked on the house that he went to see and told the people that lived there what had happened. He knew my cell phone number, and so he called me. We were about to arrive at my house when I got the call. I told my dad, and he nearly crashed the car because he got so scared. We dropped everyone off, and I decided to go with my dad to pick up my brother. When we arrived at the house, my brother was sitting on the couch watching television with the children that lived there and drinking hot chocolate. My dad hugged him and said sorry. The people who lived there said that it was fine, that their children liked my brother because he was funny. They said he could come back any time. I was relieved nothing had happened to my brother. Janice was one of those people that loved getting up early for the Black Friday sales stores have after Thanksgiving Day. She loved going to her favorite stores to see what she could get on sale. A friend told her that her favorite store was going to have an amazing sale. They were going to sell a 60-inch television for $300. Janice wanted to make sure she was there early. She went to the store during the night and set up a tent to sleep overnight. Janice noticed that no one else had shown up when she was getting her tent ready, but she didn't care. She loved being there. She was so excited about the sales that she couldn't get any sleep. At around 3.30 a.m., she finally fell asleep. She set the alarm on her phone to wake her up at 6 a.m., but because she left her music playing when she fell asleep, her phone ran out of battery. At around 8 a.m., a man who worked at the store came out and woke Janice up. She was surprised and asked him what time it was. He said it was 8 a.m., 
and she couldn't believe it. She went into the store and left her tent behind. She wanted to see if they still had the televisions. Janice saw that they didn't. People started looking at her because her hair was a mess. She felt embarrassed and went back to get her stuff. While she was going back home, she noticed another store that was open. She decided to go in and was surprised to see that they had the television she wanted. It was $500 instead of $300. She bought the television and asked one of the workers if they could take it out to her truck. She went home and asked her brother to help her move the television. Once she got the television into her home, she climbed into bed and fell asleep. Adrian loves to collect vinyl records. He got his first record from his grandpa. It was a record of Louis Armstrong. His grandpa even gave him a record player to play his records. The only thing Adrian didn't like was that he lived in a small town, so there weren't any stores that sold records. His brother told him to try looking on Craigslist. Adrian looked on Craigslist for people who were selling records of his favorite bands. He had to look for sellers in the nearest city and found one. His brother went into the city every week. Adrian asked his brother if he could go with him next time. His brother said yes. The person he found was selling his whole record collection for $200. Adrian was excited and took out the money he had been saving. Adrian's brother told him he had read about bad stuff happening to people over Craigslist. They emailed the guy that was selling the records and told him to meet at a Starbucks. When Adrian and his brother got there, they saw the guy outside of the Starbucks drinking a coffee. He had a box of records with him. The guy told him that it actually wasn't his collection. It belonged to his brother who had passed away. He wanted to sell it to someone who would appreciate them and listen to them every day like his brother once had. Adrian said that he would play one record a day. When Adrian got into his brother's car, he started looking through the records. He saw a copy of Abbey Road by the Beatles and was happy. When he took the record out, he couldn't believe what he saw. It was autographed by all four members of the band. Rocky was a big baseball fan. He lived in Philadelphia, but was originally from Los Angeles. He made sure to go watch the Dodgers every time they played the Phillies. Rocky will never forget the last game he saw at Citizens Bank Ballpark, which is where the Phillies play. It started off as a normal game for Rocky. He sat out in the stands with his girlfriend. He was fully dressed as a Dodgers fan. He had a Dodgers hat, jersey, and shirt. As the game came to the seventh inning, which is the seventh inning stretch, and everyone starts singing, Take Me Out to the Ballpark, he noticed that the Dodgers pitcher, Josh Beckett, had been pitching a no-hitter. A no-hitter is when a pitcher doesn't allow a player on the other team to get a hit. Rocky got excited because he never would have thought he would see a no-hitter, especially the Dodgers pitch a no-hitter. 
Rocky was holding on to his beer, but he wasn't drinking it. He was watching the baseball game very closely. His girlfriend would talk, but he wouldn't listen. As Beckett threw the final pitch, Rocky held his breath. He saw that it was a strike and jumped out of his chair. He even spilled some of his beer on his girlfriend, but she didn't care. She was happy as well. Rocky was thrilled. He started yelling loudly. He celebrated with other Dodger fans that were there and drank the rest of his beer. When he got home, Rocky turned on the television. He put the highlights of the game on ESPN and saw that he had come out on television. His girlfriend saw it and was excited. It was the best ending to the best baseball game he had ever been to. Age doesn't matter when it comes to helping out the needy. Shane is a nine-year-old boy that loves to help out. During a school field trip, Shane's class went to visit a warehouse where people donate food and clothes for the homeless. Shane was inspired by the workers he saw there. When he got home, he told his mom all about his field trip. Shane told his mom that he wanted to go help out. A week later, Shane's mom told him the good news. They were going to help out at a local kitchen that gave food to the homeless. Shane got excited. He got his coat and shoes. As Shane and his mom were getting to the local kitchen, Shane saw how all the homeless people were living. He saw the tents in the street and how some people didn't even have shoes. He got sad and told his mom that he was going to make sure everyone had shoes, food, and blankets. When they got inside, the manager of the kitchen thanked Shane and his mom for coming down to help. They started serving food to the homeless, and everyone that passed by thanked Shane for coming down to help. Shane felt safe and started talking to the homeless people. He told them that he wanted to help them. When they finished, Shane didn't want to leave, but they had to. Shane told his mom that he wanted to do more. During school, Shane asked his teacher to let him say something to the class. He told them about what he had seen. He asked his friends and his teacher if they had any clothes they didn't wear anymore so that he could donate them. His friends brought some clothes the next day, but his teacher did something better. She brought her friend, who was a reporter, and ran a story on Shane about how much he wanted to help out the homeless. Thousands of people donated clothes and food. Shane and his mother couldn't believe it. It has always been a dream of mine to visit New York. My parents always talked about going to New York, but we never went. I loved a lot of things about New York, but one thing that I really wanted to see was the Statue of Liberty. My parents aren't from the United States, but I was born here. They saw the Statue of Liberty as something more, not just as something people wanted to go see and take pictures of. My parents never saw the Statue of Liberty because we lived in Texas. They crossed the border and longed to see the Statue of Liberty with their own eyes, but never got the chance. I decided that I was going to fulfill their dream. 
I finally saved enough money for a plane ticket and went to stay with a friend that I had met at home, but now in New York. We talked over the internet. And she told me that if I ever got the chance to go to New York, I could stay with her. I called her the day I got my plane ticket. Guess who's going to New York, I said. She started yelling and saying that it was going to be a lot of fun. I told her that my first stop had to be the Statue of Liberty. She told me that she couldn't wait. When I got out of the plane, I couldn't believe how cold it was. I got my luggage and met my friend outside of the airport. I hugged her and we got a taxi to take us to her home. When we got to her house, she showed me her room and told me we would be leaving for the Statue of Liberty in an hour. I took a shower and put on two sweaters. We got a taxi and went to see the Statue of Liberty. It took a while, but we finally got to the island. I couldn't believe the Statue of Liberty was right before my eyes. I started crying and felt my parents were right here with me. I always felt like a foreigner in this country, even though I was born here. Now I understood why they wanted to visit the Statue of Liberty so much. There is a saying, one man's trash is another man's treasure, meaning I might not like something and throw it away, and then someone might love it and take it. I remember seeing a homeless guy searching trash cans looking for something he could sell. I asked him why he did that. He looked at me and said, One man's trash is another man's treasure, which I didn't understand at that time. In fact, he was collecting stuff he needed not only to sell, but stuff he needed to make his home. This man lived in the park by my house. No one really bothered him because he was respectful and would clean up after himself. I went running in the park one day and saw him putting together a bed with stuff he had collected from the trash. He always looked for clean stuff. If it had food trash on it, he wouldn't take it. I went back to my car and took a blanket to him. He saw it and thanked me. I remember one day the police were bothering him because they had to take away his stuff. The members of the neighborhood went to the police and told them, that he wasn't hurting anybody by being there. The homeless man looked at everyone and thanked them, but told the police to take his home away if they had to. I know you guys are just doing your job. Go ahead, he said. When the police heard him say that, they decided to leave him alone. He has been there for a couple of years now. He has even started planting a garden outside by the football field. People often go and give him food and other items he might need. He has made trash into his treasure. Carl was just 15 when he was charged with arson. He snuck into his high school with a friend and lit the auditorium curtains on fire. They thought they would have gotten away with it, but the store across the street from the school had a camera that saw Carl and his friend come out of the school. The police caught Carl and his friend while they were eating at a restaurant 
that was next to the high school. They were taken to jail. Carl admitted to burning down the auditorium and got sentenced to 10 years in prison. His friend got the same. The judge asked them why they did it, and Carl said, because we were bored and we didn't like the school. News reporters were at the school. They wanted to talk to the parents who were at the school talking to the police and the principal. Carl's father came out first and was on his way to the police station when a news reporter asked him about the situation. He said, my son just lost his childhood and he will never get that back. Carl was never a bad child, but he started acting up when he got to high school. His mom couldn't believe what he had done. People make mistakes and Carl's mistake is going to cost him a lot. The principal said that the school will be working hard to get the auditorium rebuilt, but it will take a couple of years. The school says that it will cost a million dollars to rebuild the auditorium. According to his parents, Carl said that he wishes he could take it all back and that it was a stupid mistake. My mom was pregnant with her second child. I was happy because I was going to be a big brother. My dad and mom told me that it was going to be a boy. I was excited because that meant I could boss him around and tell him to do my chores. She told all her friends that she was having a boy. Her friends all gave her their extra boy clothes that their sons had used, and my mom loved it. My dad was busy working on the crib for the baby. He painted it blue and put a blanket with race cars inside. When my mom went into the hospital, my dad was excited and jumping up and down. But after my mom had the baby, my dad came out with a confused look on his face. I asked him what was wrong, if the baby was okay. He looked at me and said, yes, but that the baby was actually a girl. My grandma looked at him and smacked him in the head. She said, that's wonderful news. Don't look so depressed. My dad laughed and said, no, I'm not depressed. I'm just confused. For the first three months of her life, my sister looked like a boy. She wore nothing but boys clothes because that's all my parents had gotten for her. I took a lot of pictures so I could tell her later that she was actually a boy, but an accident happened that changed her into a girl. My mom deleted all my photos because it was mean. I'll never forget the look on my dad's face when he came out of the delivery room. He looked like he was trying to solve a big math problem in his head. It was like he was trying to count from one to a million. Luckily, my grandma slapped it out of him. Gabriel loved working as a waiter. He loved going to work during holidays like Christmas, Thanksgiving, and Easter. When there was work during holidays, it usually meant there would be a big tip in his check. He was very friendly with the people and everyone liked working with him. The restaurant where he worked was doing a special brunch for Easter this year. Gabriel's boss, Jackie, called him to see if he could work. Gabriel said yes. 
when Gabriel showed up, he saw a giant Easter bunny walking around the restaurant. He started chuckling to himself. He had always wanted to wear a costume and walk around talking to people. As people started showing up, he noticed that the Easter bunny wasn't coming out to greet people. Gabriel had a job to do, though. He started cleaning the tables he was assigned. When he finished, he went to take his break. While he was eating, Jackie went up to Gabriel and said, I think we need you to take over as the Easter Bunny. Would you be willing to do that? Gabriel said, of course, because he didn't want to let down the boss, but also because he secretly wanted to do it. As he walked out fully dressed like the Easter Bunny, he saw children lining up to take pictures with him. He walked over and took pictures with everyone that was in line. There was a little train for the children outside in the garden. After he took the pictures, he decided to go on the train and ride it with the children. The children were asking him if he was the real Easter Bunny, and if he had been to Disneyland. Gabriel nodded his head. After he got off the train, he walked around the restaurant and started dancing in the restaurant. People started to applaud as they ate. It was the first time Gabriel ever dressed up as the Easter Bunny, but he loved every second of it. Karen and Jack had been trying to have a child for many years with no success. All that changed one day when they received the greatest gift in the world. That day, nearly one year ago, they had a healthy baby girl. They named her Julie and it was the happiest day of their lives. Karen loves to dress Julie up in pretty pastel colors, complete with bows and ribbons. Karen thinks she's the most beautiful girl in the world. The other day, the small family went shopping, and all of a sudden, Karen let out a loud scream. Oh my God! Jack ran over, thinking something had gone wrong. What's the matter? he asked. Nothing, she answered. Look at this adorable outfit. It's perfect for little Julie, she said. Jack got a little upset about this. He was running toward Karen, thinking she had fallen or that something had happened to Julie. But all that had happened is that she found a pretty blue dress for their baby girl. Shopping malls in the United States are all over the country. Some are very large, but most of them have anywhere between 50 to 100 shops each. They are places people go to eat and shop, or go to see a movie, or just hang out with friends. American teenagers love these places, especially in Los Angeles when it gets very warm. The kids go there to cool off. It was no surprise Karen wanted to go there to buy little Julie her dress. If shoppers don't find what they are looking for in one shop, there's always another one close by at a shopping mall. Karen kept talking about how perfect the outfit she found was and that she absolutely had to find the right shoes to go with it. Of course, she did find those shoes, and that made her very happy, and Jack too. Julie is going to look so pretty in her new outfit. This is how Josh met his girlfriend. He was 12 years old, and in the seventh grade, 
He had known Diana since she was a little girl, but he was shy and never talked to her. She was very pretty, and Josh was afraid to say anything to her because he thought she wouldn't like him. Josh had no self-confidence when he was a kid. He finally got the courage to talk to her one April day. The school was right on a busy street, so a crossing guard helped students cross to the other side. The guard carried a sign over his head that said, Stop, so that cars would not hit anyone. The rule was that no one could cross the street without the guard, so everyone always waited. One day, Josh got to the corner and the crossing guard was gone, so he decided to cross the street alone. That's when he heard, Hey, you're not supposed to cross the street alone. It was the crossing guard. Josh didn't see him because the guard was behind a bush tying his shoes. Josh was so scared. From that day on, he decided to go all the way around the block to avoid seeing the guard. He knew the guard would report him to the school. What happened next was something he could not believe. It turned out Diana went around the block too, but Josh didn't know that then. He accidentally ran into her one day and they started to talk. One thing led to another, and soon Josh was looking forward to going home the long way. They started walking together, and Josh discovered Diana was just as shy as he was. They walked and talked every day, and began liking each other. Soon they began telling everyone that they were boyfriend and girlfriend. This just shows how something good could come from something bad. One of the best games children play in America is hide and seek. You didn't need anything to play, and you could play for hours without getting bored. Another great thing about hide and seek is that anyone could play boys, girls, young, and old. Hide and seek was great. All you needed was a little imagination and a sense of adventure. The way the game is played is simple. I remember the first time I played. I came up to some of my brother's friends who were playing in the neighborhood. Hey, what are you guys playing? I asked. We are playing hide and seek, said Robert, my brother's best friend. Can I play? I asked, even though I didn't really know the rules. After a while, the boys let me play. The object of the game is to hide from one of the players. This person closes his eyes and counts to ten out loud to start the game. While he or she is counting, the rest of the kids run to find a hiding place. Hiding places can be anywhere, behind cars or in the bushes, just about anywhere. It was Robert's turn. When he had counted to ten, he yelled, Ready or not, here I come. Whoever is the first person found becomes it, and it's their turn to count. I thought I had the best hiding place ever. I was in the bushes near my house. I could see through the leaves everything Robert was doing, and I knew he was getting close to finding David another one of my friends. 
I was overjoyed that I wasn't going to be the first one found. I had proven myself to everybody who said I was too young to play. When all of a sudden, a mouse ran over my foot. I jumped and screamed out of the bushes and was the first one found. The next thing I knew, I was counting out loud and trying to find my friends. Many years ago, one of the best ways to spend a Saturday night with your girlfriend was to take her to the drive-in. Drive-in theaters were first opened in Southern California because of the car culture that exists here. People could go see a movie in the comfort and privacy of their own car. I remember the first time I went to a drive-in. I was 18 years old and was dating my future wife, Caroline. We went on a double date with my best friend, Alfred, and his girl, Jeannie. The drive-in we visited that night was called the Starlight. It was close to home and it had the best sound system of all the drive-ins. It also had a huge screen. We went to see Forrest Gump that night, mainly because Carol wanted to see it. I heard it is a great movie, she said. I really didn't know anything about the movie, but I did want to see something. Forrest Gump was indeed one of the best movies ever made. It had everything, humor, drama, tragedy, and triumph. It is a great film. Watching it that night under the stars with Carol on my arm was the greatest night. I tell you, babe, I was wrong about this movie. I really liked it, I said. She just smiled and gave me a hug. Alfred and Jeannie were busy kissing in the back seat, which is another advantage of going to a drive-in. Those old drive-ins were around for decades, but soon after Forrest Gump came out, many of them started closing. They closed because of the new multiplex theaters popping up all over the country. People had a choice of many films to watch at those theaters, and soon the drive-in was gone. In Los Angeles, there is only one remaining drive-in I know of, the Vineland. There might be more, but I don't know where. It is sad to see them go, but the memories are still with me. Hello, Dolly is one of the classic American plays. It was first shown in New York City in 1964 and won 10 Tony Awards. The Tony Awards are live theater's version of the Oscars. When I was in high school, our theater department decided to put on our version of Hello, Dolly and I just had to get involved. I wasn't an actor, but I was hoping there was something I could do. So I went to the director and asked him if he needed help. To my surprise, he said yes. The director's name was Michael Thomas. I almost screamed in delight when he said I could be a part of the play. Oh my God, I said, I would love to be a stagehand. Are you kidding me? A stagehand is someone who moves all the props and background in between acts. It is precision work that takes coordination between several people. I loved working in the wings which is what the backstage is called in theater lingo. The stage manager is the person who runs the backstage during a play 
and the job carries a lot of responsibility. My first stage manager was a cool guy who liked me a lot, so I got the best assignments. Hey George, how would you like to man the lighting? He asked, and I jumped at the opportunity. You bet, boss, I responded. That was how I got put in charge of the lighting for one of the best plays ever written. Even though this was just a high school production, we played to packed houses almost every night we were on. I did such a great job that when the theater department decided to put on West Side Story the next semester, they asked me if I wanted to join the team. It was such an honor to be selected. So, of course, my answer was yes. One of the greatest American traditions is the game of baseball. Living in Los Angeles has given me the chance to watch one of the oldest baseball teams in the history of the game, the Dodgers. The team came into existence in New York City in the 1880s when they were known by several names. Until 1956, the Dodgers played in Brooklyn, New York, but in 1957 the team moved west to Los Angeles and it has played there ever since. I recently asked my wife Josie if she wanted to go to a game one night, and of course she said yes. Why wouldn't I want to go? The weather is great and the stadium is beautiful. Besides, I think we need a break in our routine, she said. You're absolutely right, baby. Let's go, I said. We were off to Dodger Stadium which is nestled in the hills just north of downtown L.A. in a neighborhood called Chavez Ravine. Even though it is the third oldest stadium in the country, it is still beautiful. Wow, this place never gets old, I said as we got to our seats. Josie agreed. It was a perfect night for a ball game. The temperature was in the low 70s, and it was a clear, breezy night. The Dodgers were playing the Giants that night. The two teams have been playing each other for about 100 years, ever since both teams were in New York. The Giants moved the same year the Dodgers did, only they moved up north to San Francisco. That didn't stop the rivalry, though. The teams hate each other today as much as they did back in New York. The best part of the night was that the Dodgers won, so I had a couple of Dodger dogs. I don't know what they do to these hot dogs, but they are delicious, I told Josie. She wiped some mustard off her face and said, Absolutely. Did you get your costume done last night? I asked my girlfriend, Audrey, in the early morning of October 31st. Of course, it was ready, but you're not going to see it until tonight, she said. That was a real disappointment. I had been looking forward to seeing her latest Halloween creation. Audrey is a fine seamstress and every year she makes the best costumes for the Halloween parties we try to attend. On the other hand, I usually just put some old rags on and go as a hobo or a pirate or something lame like that, but not Audrey. She goes all out. Last year she went as a beautiful witch complete with the pointy hat and witch's broom. She looked beautiful. 
The Halloween tradition is very old in the United States. No one really knows how it was first celebrated, but it did come from somewhere in Europe. It was originally called All Hallows Eve and celebrated on the last day of October. It precedes All Hallows Day, which is a day to honor dead relatives. Today it means parties for the adults and trick-or-treating for the kids. Trick-or-treating is where kids also dress up in costumes and go door to door to get candy treats. It's a whole lot of fun. Some people say Halloween is a Welsh or Celtic tradition, while others say its roots are Christian. But it doesn't really matter anymore. We just like to get dressed up like fools, go to parties, and eat lots of candy. Audrey finally showed up at my door. She was strikingly beautiful. She was dressed as a fairy princess and was glowing in her white gown. You look amazing, I told her. She just laughed and said, I know, and tapped me with her wand. When I was 13 years old, I loved playing the drums. I guess banging on the drums gave me an emotional outlet for a very troubled time in my youth. When you're 13, everything seems to come at you from all directions. The drums helped me cope with being a teenager. One day, I called my friend Rudy on the phone. Rudy loved playing around with his guitar. Neither one of us had ever taken music lessons, but we loved our instruments. Hey Rudy, why don't you come over? We can play for a while, I suggested. No problem, man. If it's okay with you, I'll bring my cousin Bobby with me. He plays the bass guitar. I told him that would be great and waited for them to arrive. Bobby didn't just play bass. He jammed at it. You really rock on that bass, Bobby, I told him. He said he had been playing for years and wanted to form a band. We all looked at each other and it hit us like a bolt of lightning. We can do this, Rudy and I said at the same time. All we need is a vocalist, I said, to which Bobby chirped, I can do that too. That was the beginning of the best rock and roll band ever, the Coke Bottles. Of course that was an exaggeration, but it turned out we were pretty good for a bunch of novices. The three of us began meeting at my place every week to practice playing together and to bounce song ideas off each other. Bobby could actually sing. With Rudy and me putting in all those hours of practice, we got pretty good. We got so good that we played at a couple of parties and at a free concert in the park festival about a year later. That was as far as we got, though. Rudy joined the army the following year. Bobby and I were never able to find another lead guitarist. So the greatest rock and roll band, the Coke Bottles, never made it big. But that was okay with me. We had our day in the sun. Two years ago, I graduated from high school. My father, mother, and sisters all came to see me walk up the stage to receive my diploma. Most of my extended family was there too, including my aunts and uncles, and some of my best friends. To my surprise, my friend Eddie, who graduated from the same school the year before, came up to congratulate me as soon as the ceremony was over. Hey, feels great, doesn't it? said Eddie. It sure does, I responded excitedly. Eddie was like a big brother to me. He joined the Navy after graduation. Now that I was out of high school, he came back specifically to talk to me about my plans. I had no idea he was coming because he wanted it to be a surprise, and it sure was. Okay, now that you're out of high school, what are you going to do with your life? he asked. To tell the truth, I didn't have a clue. Most of my classmates knew exactly where they wanted to go to college, or if they were going to join the military. Some of them were like me, clueless. 
No one had ever been interested enough in me to try to give me some guidance except Eddie. He told me about college and that I should consider going to a community college since I hadn't applied to a four-year university. I was very interested, but confused. You never went to college, Eddie. How did you know it's the right thing to do? I asked. Eddie just smiled and said he just knew and that I needed to trust him on this one. Since I trusted him like a brother, I took his advice and enrolled in a community college. It's been quite an experience, I must admit. Eddie was right. I will be transferring to UCLA next semester, and things are looking up for me. I owe it all to my big brother, Eddie. Living in Southern California has its advantages. One of those advantages is living so near the mighty Pacific Ocean. It is the largest ocean in the world, big, blue, and beautiful. One of my favorite pastimes when I was growing up was taking a long drive up Pacific Coast Highway. It is a beautiful drive, winding lazily in and out of sight of the sea, and going up hills and down coastal valleys. For first-time cruisers, it could be breathtaking. One lazy Saturday, I was a bit bored, so I called my girlfriend, who was studying for her English test on the coming Monday, to see if she wanted to go for a ride. Hey, Sheila, want to go for a cruise? She hemmed and hawed for a while before finally agreeing to go with me. Where are we going? she asked, but I wanted it to be a surprise. She had been hitting the books pretty hard lately because of her upcoming midterm exams. I figured she needed a break, and so did I. We started driving. Soon we were going through the Santa Monica Tunnel. This tunnel is especially nice. When you enter it, you have no clue what is waiting on the other end. As soon as the exit comes into view, the ocean, in all its glory, appears right before your eyes. Sheila was instantly delighted. She turned to me after a while and said, Thanks, baby. I really needed this. I said, Me too, babe. We talked for what seemed like hours. After that, we went up and down, left and right, with the ocean as our companion. We ended up in Santa Barbara, a coastal town about 140 miles north of Los Angeles. It was getting late, so we decided to stay for the night. Santa Barbara is a college town, so it's pretty easy to find affordable rooms to spend the night. That was one of the best nights of my young life. Mary was a girl with long brown hair and pretty eyes. Every evening she would take her dog out for a walk. Mary's dog was a beagle. She had named him Buddy because he was so friendly to everyone he met. Buddy never barked or bit anyone when Mary took him out on walks. Buddy did not even flinch at the sight of cats and other dogs. He truly was a buddy to all. One night, as Mary was walking Buddy, something unexpected occurred. For the first time in his life, Buddy became aggravated. What's the matter, Buddy? Mary asked. Buddy replied only in barks, as if he was trying to communicate back. All of a sudden, the wind grew still and the air became cold. Mary decided to turn around and head back home. But before she could, a raspy voice called out her name. Mary right away turned around and yelled, Who's there? Buddy had stopped barking. A boy stepped forward from the shadows and slowly revealed his identity. Tom, is that you? Mary asked the timid boy, who was now in plain sight. Tom was looking down at the floor with his hands in his pockets. What are you doing, Tom? Have you been following me? Mary asked, slightly confused. Tom stood there embarrassed and slowly started talking. I'm sorry I snuck up on you. I didn't mean to frighten you, Tom first said. Mary could tell that Tom was nervous. She also knew of the feelings Tom had for her. It's not safe for someone like you to be walking at night all alone, Tom said. I'm not alone. I have Buddy, Mary replied. You should have somebody accompanying you and Buddy on nights like these, said Tom. Would you like to tag along, Tom? Mary asked. Tom was too struck to answer. He had been waiting for this moment to happen. 
Mary and Tom became fast friends after their nightly meet-up. Every night at seven o'clock, Tom would pick up Mary at her house and the two would walk Buddy around the neighborhood for about an hour. Mary no longer walked Buddy alone at night, and Tom no longer followed Mary. One night, as they were walking, Buddy, Mary, and Tom decided to grab a bite to eat because they were hungry. "'Where do you want to eat?' Tom asked Mary. "'Let's go to Pizza Mountain,' she replied. "'I don't feel like eating pizza right now,' Tom said. "'Do you have any suggestions?' Mary asked. "'How about going back to my house? I'll cook our own food,' Tom said. Mary thought this was a great idea. The two headed back to the street where they lived and thought about what to cook on the way. When they arrived, they had decided on making hamburgers. Mary wrote down a list of ingredients that they were going to need to make hamburgers. Tom went to the refrigerator and took out all the ingredients that he had. Where are the buns? Mary asked when she saw they were missing. I'll run to the market and get some hamburger buns, Tom said. By the time Tom came back from the market, Mary had prepared the food. All they needed to do now was put the food between the buns. Mary and Tom were about to take their first bites into their burgers when Buddy came in through the door, wagging his tail and salivating. I think he wants a burger, Tom said. Mary rose from her seat and made a burger for Buddy. Buddy ate the burger in one bite as soon as Mary handed it to him. In a small town in California, there lived a boy by the name of Desmond Walker. Desmond lived with his mom and dad in a three-bedroom house. Desmond was ten years old and had an active imagination. His mother had her hands full watching over Desmond. That boy of hers would get in all sorts of trouble. Always safety first, Desmond, is what she always repeated to her son. Desmond and his mother went out grocery shopping one Friday evening. The supermarket's parking lot was jam-packed with cars that Friday evening. "'Stick close to me, Desmond,' said his mom as they entered the supermarket. Desmond's mom asked him to fetch a shopping cart. He grabbed a shopping cart and started heading back to where his mom was. Desmond then hopped on the shopping cart and raced away at top speed. "'That's not too smart, Desmond,' said a voice in Desmond's head. Desmond stopped and began pushing the cart like before. He remembered what his mom always said to him, "'Always safety first. After Desmond handed the cart to his mother, the two headed towards the dairy section to grab some milk. "'Desmond, stay close to me,' Desmond's mom said. The supermarket was bustling with shoppers. Desmond stood close to his mother as they treaded carefully through the hordes of people. Then, in an instant, Desmond thought of running away and hiding from his mom as a trick. Just as he was about to do so, Desmond heard the voice again. "'That's not a good idea, Desmond,' the voice said. Desmond had remembered his mom's golden rule. "'Always safety first. "'You've been such a good boy today,' Desmond's mom said to Desmond. Desmond said thank you and was treated to ice cream as a reward. Eddie loved to play the guitar. His favorite kind of music to play and listen to was rock and roll. Eddie had been playing the guitar since the age of 13. He had an older brother who also played the guitar. It was his older brother who first taught him how to play the guitar. Eddie, now 17 years old, aspired to be a famous musician one day. He knew he could not do this by himself, so he set out on a talent search for someone to play alongside with him. One day, Eddie met another guitar player named Jake. Jake was around the same age as Eddie. Both Eddie and Jake shared a similar taste in music. When Eddie asked Jake if he would like to form a band, Jake said yes. What's the name of our band? Jake asked. Eddie had not thought of a name for the group yet. I'm open to any suggestions you might have, Eddie said to Jake. The next day, Jake thought of a perfect name. Eddie liked the name as soon as he heard it. From then on, the name of Eddie and Jake's band was Jet Sam. Eddie and Jake started learning how to play songs on their guitars together. 
Although they both listened to a variety of rock groups, they focused primarily on learning the songs of their favorite ensemble, the Beatles. Almost everybody loved the Beatles. Learning to sing and play their songs seemed like the best thing to do. After learning a handful of songs, Eddie and Jake both felt ready to perform in front of an audience. Eddie and Jake got their acoustic guitars and performed at an open mic night at a local community center. The audience roared with tremendous applause after Jet Sam's set ended. Eddie and Jake bowed and thanked the audience for coming. Learning another language is a difficult task, but not impossible. Andrew knew the challenge that lied ahead, but was determined to achieve his goal of learning Spanish. Andrew wanted to learn Spanish because his girlfriend's family was from Guatemala. Andrew had already learned some basic words. Yes in Spanish was sí, and no was no, and thank you was gracias. It was just a matter of time before he became fluent and began talking to his girlfriend's relatives. Andrew had been receiving lessons from his next-door neighbor, José. José was fluent in both Spanish and English. He was born in Mexico and immigrated to the United States at the age of ten. José was happy to teach Andrew Spanish. Andrew insisted on paying José for the lessons, even though José had offered to do it for free. After a few months, Andrew was able to communicate well enough to hold a simple conversation. Andrew decided to test his Spanish by introducing himself in Spanish to his girlfriend. Hola, mi nombre es Andrew, Andrew said with a smile on his face. He had said in perfect Spanish, hello, my name is Andrew. His girlfriend was impressed at his Spanish as they shared a conversation about the weather. Jose's lessons had paid off. Andrew realized that if he wished to keep progressing in learning Spanish, the best thing to do was enroll in a Spanish course at the community college. That's exactly what he did the following day. Andrew asked some of his friends if they would like to learn Spanish with him at the community college. No, thank you, most of them said. Andrew's friends thought it would be too hard to learn Spanish. Little did his friends know that Spanish wasn't that hard to learn. Andrew had learned this firsthand. It's never too late to learn. Emily Johnson had turned 30 when she decided to go back to college to finish her degree. Ten years had passed since she last attended East Los Angeles College. It had been her dream to finish her two years in ELAC and transfer to Cal State LA. Emily was not able to finish because she started working. Even though Emily found a good job, she still had the urge to complete her education. After all, what kind of example would she be setting for her daughters by not receiving her degree? Emily wanted her children to succeed by going to college and getting a better career than she had. Emily was aware of the difficulties of going to school while working and taking care of two daughters. She braced herself and accepted the challenge. She went to work during the daytime and went to class in the evening after taking her daughters to her mother's house. Emily had to maintain this routine for one year in order to transfer. Sure enough, she made it through and was accepted into Cal State LA. Emily's time at the university was slightly more grueling compared to community college. She had been studying sociology. The same challenges presented themselves again. Emily had only completed her general education classes at community college, and now the focus was in her subject of interest. Emily passed all her classes with flying colors in a span of two years. It took all of her dedication and willpower to finish her education. Emily received her bachelor's degree in sociology. Her daughters would look up to their mother in the years to come and realize that it's never too late to go back to school. When are you going to get a haircut? Johnny's relatives would ask whenever they saw him. Johnny's reply was always the same, when pigs start to fly. Although Johnny was aware that his relatives thought he was funny, he was also aware of their concern regarding his shoulder-length hair. Johnny's hair was black and wavy. He began growing it after high school. Two years had passed since then, 
and Johnny had no intention of cutting it any time soon. Johnny loved his long hair, and took good care of it. Every day he would wash it, and brush it fifty times. Johnny felt so cool with his long hair, it made him look like a rock star. While in high school, Johnny always had short hair. Although it did not look unappealing, he was not too fond of his short hair, and desired to grow it out one day. He made a promise to himself to do so after graduation. Johnny had gone through with his promise. Johnny's hair received plenty of attention. As he walked down the street, he often heard, Nice hair, kid, from strangers. Thank you very much, Johnny would reply, feeling flattered. Once Johnny passed a group of girls who giggled and looked at him. I like your hair, one of them said to Johnny as he walked away. Being the cool cat that he now was, Johnny loved every minute of having long hair. Johnny wondered why he didn't decide to let his hair grow sooner. It was the best decision he had ever made, and nothing in the world could make him cut it. Johnny enjoyed walking around with his long black hair. He also enjoyed the attention strangers and friends would give him. Strolling down the street was never the same after he started doing it with long hair. Johnny never wanted to cut his hair short ever again. He could think of no good reason to do so. This would all change with one conversation on a Saturday morning while having breakfast with his parents. It seemed like any other regular Saturday morning at Johnny's house. Mom was cooking pancakes, Dad was reading the newspaper, Johnny was waiting, sitting at the table drinking some orange juice. Johnny, it is time for you to get a job, Johnny's dad said all of a sudden, without any warning. Johnny nearly spit out his orange juice after hearing his dad's startling remark. What? Johnny said after gulping. There comes a time in every boy's life when he must finally cut his hair and get a job, Johnny's dad told him. But dad, Johnny said, trying to reason. No buts, Johnny's dad snapped. That afternoon, Johnny's parents took him to a barber shop to get a haircut. He tried his best to hold back his tears on the way to the barber shop. Johnny reluctantly sat down on the barber's chair, wearing a frown on his face. Why the long face? asked the barber. He doesn't want to get a haircut, Johnny's mom replied. It's just hair. It'll grow back one day, the barber said, trying to cheer him up. The following week, Johnny was hired at McDonald's. He had neat, short hair. Tony was really excited to see his friend Kevin. They had been friends since elementary school all the way through high school. When they started college, they both headed their separate ways. Tony wanted to study electrical engineering, and Kevin wanted to become a doctor. Their career choices led them into different directions, but their friendship was still intact. Tony and Kevin had been very close friends in elementary school. They started their friendship while doing a small painting assignment. When Kevin noticed Tony painting a really nice rocket, Kevin complimented him on it, and the two started talking about their interests in other things. What really kept them together at that moment was when Tony acknowledged Kevin's reaction when Tony accidentally dropped his set of paints on the classroom floor. Tony was embarrassed and terrified, but Kevin wasn't hesitant to help him out by cleaning it up. Growing up, Tony and Kevin shared similar interests. When they were in elementary school, they both shared a dream of becoming astronauts and flying in spaceships to discover unknown galaxies and unknown life forms. In middle school, they both shared the dream of becoming famous basketball players. Then, in high school, they both had the urge to become famous rock stars. It wasn't always a cheerful friendship. Sometimes they both fought and shared different views about different things. Despite their differences, Tony and Kevin didn't tear their friendship apart. In moments of grief and doubts, they were there to support each other. Tony and Kevin have both recently received their bachelor's degree. They have kept in contact up until now and have decided to get together and catch up on lost time. Sandra was an eight-year-old girl. Her best friend used to be her neighbor, who had unfortunately moved to another state about a month ago. Sandra was upset about her friend's move. 
They still send emails and text messages to each other to keep in contact, but she already felt their friendship falling apart. Recently, a new family had moved into the house where her friend used to live in. It was a family of four, a married couple with two children. One of the children was a five-year-old boy, and the other was a girl who was one year older than Sandra. Sandra's mother and father had gone over to introduce themselves as neighbors. Sandra's mother suggested Sandra head over to do the same. Sandra was not fond of the idea. Nonetheless, Sandra's mother insisted and forced her to introduce herself to their new neighbors. When walking over, Sandra noticed the five-year-old boy of the neighbor's family playing in the mud in their front yard. Sandra approached him and said, Hi, I'm Sandra. We are neighbors. What is your name? The boy looked up at Sandra and yelled, I'm Benjamin. He then flung a mud ball at Sandra. She screamed in shock. Benjamin's older sister then ran out of her house to see what was going on and noticed Sandra with mud all over her shirt. Benjamin's sister apologized to Sandra and scolded Benjamin, saying, Benjamin, apologize. Why did you do that? Benjamin replied, yelling, Because she killed my men and stepped on my castle. Sandra then noticed that she was standing right on his toy soldiers. Sandra then apologized, and Benjamin's sister began to laugh at her and said, Don't worry about it. I'm Jessica. What's your name? The two began talking. It was the beginning of a new friendship. Carla had just moved to the city and enrolled her eight-year-old son Gavin in a new school. Carla used to be a very active participant in the school community. She always volunteered in the classroom, went to parent-teacher association meetings, and chaperoned on class trips. Carla wanted to do the same thing at the new school her son was attending. She felt it was a good example for Gavin, and it helped her be more in tune with whatever was going on at the school. The new school, however, had different rules. Carla couldn't just show up in the classroom and offer to help. She couldn't even offer to chaperone on class trips. District regulations required her to be fingerprinted. The school district would then run a background check on Carla based on the fingerprints. The school district had very strict rules about allowing people with criminal convictions to volunteer in the school. While it didn't cost Carla anything to get fingerprinted, the fingerprinting office had very limited hours. She also couldn't just walk in when it was convenient for her. She had to make an appointment. The fingerprinting office was also located very far from where Carla lived. She would have to take two buses to get there. Carla also had to get a tuberculosis test. The TB test was easy. It was just a little prick on her lower arm, but this required another separate appointment at a separate location. The test didn't cost Carla anything, but again, the office where she had to go was far. Carla understood that the school district wants children to be safe and healthy, but she also felt they were making it hard for parents. Anthony wanted to get cable television for the new apartment he rented with his wife and children. He especially was interested in seeing channels from his home country. He called the local cable company to sign up. There were many options for Anthony to choose from. The basic service was the least expensive, but it didn't include any of the channels from his country. So Anthony signed up for a package that included channels from his country. However, that package didn't include cartoon channels that his children liked to see, so he added an expanded package to include cartoon channels. That still left out channels that showed certain series that his wife liked to see, so Anthony signed up for a special promotion that included a premium channel for one month free. The customer service representative set an appointment to send a technician to Anthony's house in a week. The appointment wasn't for an exact time. Instead, the customer service representative said that the technician would come between noon and two in the afternoon. When the technician arrived, he set up a converter box and a digital recorder box to the family television in the living room. 
The technician gave Anthony a remote and a channel guide. Anthony had to sign some papers before the technician left. Anthony, his wife, and their children enjoyed the hundreds of channels they now had thanks to cable. One month after the technician came and installed all of the equipment, a bill arrived. The bill totaled almost two hundred dollars. Anthony could not afford to pay that much on a monthly basis. He discussed it with his wife. They decided not to keep the channels from their country and the premium channels his wife enjoyed. The only extra channels Anthony kept were the cartoon channels for his kids. Frank just moved from an apartment into a small house with his family. When he lived in a six-story apartment building, dealing with the trash was easy. Frank usually just dropped a bag of garbage down the trash compactor chute. There was one trash compactor chute on every floor of the building. The chute was in a small room located next to the elevator. Frank had to take cans, bottles, and other recyclables to the basement and put them in a special bin. He did not, though, have to worry about remembering what day was trash day. He did not have to worry about taking the trash out to be collected. That was the job of the building's superintendent. The two-bedroom house Frank moved into had no superintendent, though. Frank was provided with three trash cans by the city. Each trash can was a different color. The black one was for regular garbage. The blue one was for paper, plastic, and cans so that they could be recycled. The green bin was for leaves, cut grass, and tree trimmings. Each bin needed to be put out to the curb before the city sanitation trucks came around early Monday morning. Frank couldn't put the cans out too early either. If he put the cans out on the curb before 6 p.m. on Sunday evenings, he could get a ticket and have to pay a fine. Frank decided to set a reminder on his cell phone. Every Sunday night at 6 in the evening his phone would beep reminding him to take the trash bins to the curb. Frank also had to pay the city every three months for trash collection. That was something that he didn't have to do when he rented an apartment. Living in a house sure involved a lot more responsibility than living in an apartment building. Andrea's acne was getting worse by the day. Not only did it not look good, but it made her feel self-conscious. She wanted to go see a dermatologist about her skin condition. Andrea had health insurance through her job. When she signed up for a health plan, she chose a primary care physician. That doctor would take care of Andrea's basic health needs. The primary care physician was not a dermatologist, though. If Andrea wanted the health insurance to pay for the dermatologist, she first needed to make an appointment with her regular physician. Otherwise, Andrea would have to pay out of her own pocket to see a dermatologist. Andrea called her primary care provider. She had to wait a week for an appointment since her acne was not an emergency. When it was time for the appointment, she showed her doctor the acne problem. Her primary care physician was able to prescribe a skin cream for Andrea. Andrea used that skin cream for a week, but her acne did not get any better. She called her doctor back. The doctor couldn't do anything else for her, so the doctor gave her a referral to see a skin specialist, a dermatologist. Andrea called the dermatologist, but she had to wait another three weeks for an appointment. Her acne had gotten worse over these three weeks. When she finally saw the dermatologist, she ran a number of blood tests and allergy tests. The dermatologist told Andrea that the acne was actually an allergic reaction to fried foods. Andrea thought it was a lot of trouble to finally find out what was wrong. She was happy, though, that she knew all she had to do was not eat fried food, which was not good for her waistline or her skin. It was almost 5 p.m. on Friday afternoon. Ed was working. His co-worker, Jack, popped his head inside Ed's cubicle. "'Are you coming to happy hour?' Jack asked. Ed had heard of happy meal, but he had never heard about happy hour. Ed asked Jack what happy hour was. Jack explained that happy hour was actually a few hours on weekday afternoons when people were leaving work, 
and when bars had special prices on drinks and appetizers. Sometimes you pay for only one drink, and they give you two. Other places have a special menu of food and drinks that is only good during certain hours. Ed thought that it really did sound like a good reason to be happy. However, Ed still had at least an hour's worth of work to do. Ed's co-workers encouraged him to come and have at least one drink with them. Ed finally decided to go with them to the nearby pub. However, Ed had more than one drink. He had had a few. He had so many drinks that his co-workers put him in a taxi home at the end of the night. On Saturday morning, Ed was not feeling happy at all. He had a horrible headache and felt sick to his stomach. His wife made him a special soup and gave him some medicine. When Ed returned to work on Monday morning, he felt much better physically. His co-workers, however, teased him about drinking so much on Friday. His boss wondered why Ed hadn't completed all the work he was supposed to finish on Friday. Ed certainly couldn't tell his boss that he left work early to go drink with his colleagues. Ed was called into his boss's office to explain. I guess I was too happy, Ed said unhappily. One of the greatest moments in a young person's life is the day when he or she starts learning to drive. Learning to drive is a rite of passage. It is one of the steps young people take to develop into adulthood. This is a wondrous time full of excitement and expectations. One of the most attractive things about learning to drive is the freedom that comes from operating a vehicle. Once people are able to drive a vehicle, they can go anywhere in the city and beyond. In Southern California, the region was planned and built in a spread-out fashion with miles and miles of freeway access. A new driver no longer needs to rely on others to go somewhere. He or she is now free to go out on their own. When Michael Allen first learned to drive, he was so excited. He was 16 years old, which in California means he can get a driver's permit. After six months with a permit, he could have a license to drive. Michael had been pestering his father to teach him how to drive for months, and now came the big day. His father, Edward, was a big, strong man who insisted on teaching Michael on a standard transmission car. That meant Michael had to learn how to operate a clutch and gear shifter, which is not easy. The two began their lessons. Edward was a difficult taskmaster, and Michael was having great difficulty at first. Let the clutch out slowly. Edward began yelling every time Michael didn't do it correctly. Ease it through. You can do it said Edward to his son. I'm trying, Dad, I'm trying, said Michael. It was not pleasant at first, but soon Michael was driving up and down the block. He was very pleased, and so was his dad. Michael was now a driver. Spring finally arrived. This past winter was a long, cold, and snowy one. Gonzalo was ready to get outdoors and play some sports. However, since Gonzalo was new in town, he didn't have that many friends. He decided to try to get some of his co-workers together. In the company lunchroom, he put up a paper. The paper invited people to meet Gonzalo at a nearby park on Saturday for a game of football. Football was Gonzalo's favorite sport. He played it ever since he was a kid. On Saturday morning, Gonzalo was excited to go to the park with his new friends to play some football. He was a little worried that people wouldn't show up. Gonzalo walked to the park early. He wanted to be the first one there to meet everyone. He packed his cleats and a ball in a backpack. Gonzalo waited in an open field close to the entrance to the park. That way everyone could see him. He would also be preventing others from taking the space. Slowly but surely, Gonzalo's co-workers began coming into the park. Some of them even brought friends and family from outside of work. Gonzalo was certain they would have a great game. I brought a ball, Gonzalo told one of his co-workers, Leo, who said that he had also brought a ball. Leo said he was a huge football fan. Sometimes Leo even held parties at his house to watch football. Both Leo and Gonzalo went to their 
backpacks to get their balls. That was when they realized there had been a miscommunication. Leo's ball was oblong and brown, while Gonzalo's ball was a round soccer ball. Gonzalo had forgotten that in the United States, football and soccer were different sports. Leo had forgotten that, too. They compromised and played one game of soccer and one game of American football. Food trucks used to be somewhere fast to get meals for office workers in cities across the United States. The food used to be just average, certainly nothing to boast about. Food trucks were a matter of convenience and usually offered inexpensive meals. At lunchtime, in cities across the United States, workers lined up to order a sandwich and a canned soda. The meal rarely cost more than five dollars. They took their food and ate as they walked. Some workers would take their food back to their offices and eat in the company lunchroom or at their desks. Food trucks have come a long way. They are no longer thought of as just food on wheels. Now food trucks are considered a gourmet dining experience. There are food trucks selling cuisine from all over the world. There are Korean barbecue food trucks and food trucks that sell lobster rolls. There are even food trucks that specialize in desserts. These dessert food trucks sell more than just ice cream cones. They sell cakes and pies. There are even cupcake trucks. Food trucks have become so popular that many use social media to reach customers and create a fan base. Some food trucks use Twitter to let customers know what their menu is for the day. Other food trucks use Facebook to let customers know on what corner they will be parked. These clean food trucks with their gourmet food and large fan base are not a bargain anymore, though. Rarely can you get a meal from a food truck for less than $10. Some people think the price is worth the quality. Others just bring sandwiches from home. Nelson Mandela was a South African anti-apartheid activist and human rights advocate whose life had a profound effect on American culture. Mandela served as president of South Africa from 1994 through 1999, but his story began decades earlier. His life's work was to bring South Africa into mainstream 20th century thinking by ending apartheid. Apartheid was a system of South African government that was based on racial segregation between the minority white population and the black South Africans. It was a controversial form of government that was in effect from 1948 to 1994 and caused great social turmoil. The system was put into place following World War II, but racial segregation began much earlier in the country. Apartheid separated South Africans by race by placing people into four different classifications, white, black, colored, and Indian. Each group had different levels of privilege, with white South Africans being the most favored. From 1960 to 1983, 3.5 million black South Africans were forcibly removed from their homes. In 1970, all non-white politicians were removed from government. Mandela's move to end apartheid began in 1949 when he supported and organized non-violent boycotts, strikes, and civil disobedience. He was arrested and charged with treason in 1956 for his role in the social uprising and was eventually jailed for 27 years. During this time, most of the countries in the world called for his release and placed trade embargoes against the white regime. The country finally gave in to international pressure and released Mandela. He became an international symbol for peaceful demonstration and for his humanitarian work and perseverance. He was elected president of South Africa in 1994 serving for six years. Mandela died in December 2013. One of the most influential figures in human history is Charles Darwin. Darwin has been called the father of evolution for his work in evolutionary science. In the United States, Darwin has become the symbol for atheists in the country as his theory of evolution smacks in the face of creationism 
His theory claims that all of Earth's species have been descended from their ancestors and that they have adapted to their surroundings throughout history. It also claims that every species has a common ancestor. Darwin introduced his theory in his landmark book On the Origin of Species in 1859. The book has met with suspicion from both the scientific community and the general public, but by the 1870s his work was beginning to gain mass acceptance. One of his most significant studies came when he sailed with the HMS Beagle, a British sea vessel, to the Galapagos Islands. The islands have been long isolated from the South American mainland and provided him with a unique insight on the process of evolution. When sailing from island to island, Darwin noticed similarities between island species and mainland species. Most were similar in many ways, but some had subtle differences. He also found that the same species had differences from island to island. To Darwin, it was clear that the reason for the slight differences was the individual environment of each island. These islands showed Darwin the evolution process in the making. Darwin has many critics from religious circles. A very famous caricature of Darwin depicting him as a half-human monkey was published in 1871 in response to his theory that humans evolved from ape-like creatures. He spawned a movement of non-believers called Darwinism, which includes people who feel his theories are rooted in the scientific method as opposed to religious dogma. Barbara dropped out of college 17 years ago when she had her first daughter. She always regretted dropping out. She had been a good student and had enjoyed going to classes in college. However, when she had her daughter, she didn't have time to continue with her studies. She needed to find a full-time job. Barbara also regretted dropping out of college because it was hard to find a good job without a college degree. While Barbara was lucky enough to always find work, some of the jobs she had didn't pay well. Most of them didn't offer benefits like vacation pay and health insurance. Barbara was sure that if she had a college degree, finding a better paying job with benefits would be easier. Barbara's daughter was now a teenager. She was beginning to look at colleges. This inspired Barbara to go back to school herself. Barbara wanted to finally get her bachelor's degree. Since her daughter was in high school, Barbara had more time. She didn't have to constantly watch over her daughter. However, even as a teenager, Barbara's daughter still needed to eat and needed clothes, so going to college on a regular schedule was not an option for Barbara. Barbara went to the local community college to learn about her options. A college counselor told her that she could take online classes to finish her degree. Barbara was worried that these classes wouldn't give the same credit as a traditional college class would. The counselor told her the credits were the same, and online classes were good for non-traditional students like her. Barbara enrolled and became a student again. One of the world's greatest tragedies was the sinking of the luxury liner Titanic. Although it was a British ship, many Americans were on board during that terrible night of April 15, 1912. The ship was on its maiden voyage on that night when it struck an iceberg in the deep waters of the North Atlantic Ocean. The ship was en route to New York City from Southampton, UK, when it hit the iceberg, killing more than 1,500 of the 2,224 passengers. The ship was the largest ship ever built to that date, and it was thought to be unsinkable. The ship's passengers varied from some of the richest people in the world at the time to thousands of immigrant workers who were trying to find work in the United States. The Titanic was equipped with technology safety features like remote control watertight doors and watertight compartments, but it did not carry enough lifeboats for all passengers. Because of the immense size of the ship, it was thought to be unsinkable, a fact that contributed to a small number of lifeboats carried on the ship. Additionally, many of the lifeboats were not filled to capacity when they were launched, causing more loss of life. Most of those killed that night were men. 
The protocol followed by the ship's officers required women and children first when loading lifeboats. The accident was met by international shock and grief. Many of today's maritime rules were put into place because of this disaster. Only 705 passengers floating on lifeboats were saved that night. The ship broke into two parts before it went under. It remains more than a mile deep in the North Atlantic. The sinking of the Titanic has been documented in film and literature over the years.